This is Todd Steed, Studio 865 you're listening to and watching. Today we have R.B. Morris, Knoxville singer-songwriter, though he's known outside of Knoxville. Uh, this is where you call home, don't you? <laughs> this is home. Yeah. And when did you first start doing something uh, musical here in Knoxville? How did, how did you get into becoming a songwriter, a poet, which came first? Well, um, I think the first musical thing that I did was singing in church when I was a kid. Yeah. That was the first uh, introduction to uh, music and, and I guess you could say performing in some way or another. Uh, I didn't start writing songs until I was in high school really. I, actually I wrote a few here and there just as a kid. I was kind of fascinated with it but at some point I started to focus on it more. When you were singing in the church, did you get any feedback on your abilities back then, or? Well, it was a, little, it was a whole different setup. Um, I think it's good to kind of come through a gospel yeah. thing because you know, singing, singing in church or singing uh, gospel, I always feel like you, you're supposed to have some soul about it, and that's really the thing. Whether or not if you pull a song off, it's because you were soulful and you got into it, and not so much just the notes you hit or something. Yeah. And then these the themes, biblical themes, come through a lot of your work. Here and there, they do. It's all been turned into a different uh, a perspective, I guess. But uh, yeah, it still plays in. It's part of the language, really. How how long before you started writing songs did you feel like, hey, I'm good at this? Well, I'm having, I'm always having a hard time with it, and. Uh, um, Sometimes you think you're good at it, some, and lots of times you just think, you know, you're you're dry or it's not coming, you know. Or, um, uh, but somewhere uh, back when I when I first started playing, um, I ended up in a lot of uh, bluegrass bands and old timey bands and that sort of thing, and we were doing a lot of cover songs. Uh, of course, it was just a good time band. But I would write one occasionally, and we would uh, slip it into the mix, you know, and people would respond to it and say they really liked it and, you know, that sort of thing. And after a while, I felt like, uh, because I loved the great songwriters and was, I was really following uh, a lot of people, watching their new records and stuff like that, I was kind of studying them. At some point, you know, I felt like that's what I was aspiring to be. And uh, sometimes I thought I could hit it, and other times I, it was a miss, you know. Is there anything that you noticed that was the same in all of your favorite songwriters? Some ability or some unknown quantity? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, uh, um, the songwriters who I consider to also be great poets as such because of what they did with words often had an, uh, a, an ability to juxtapose one thing against another that doesn't look like it would fit, yeah. you know, and they would make it fit, and they would make the listener's mind travel right over that, whereas the rest of us songwriters are trying to piece it together, A, B, C, you know, this has to lead to this and all that, and they could just jump right through some of that, and I, I thought that was incredible, and I often wondered about that. Who was your first favorite songwriter? <clears throat> well, when I was a kid, I got into Johnny Horton a lot. And North to Alaska? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think Johnny wrote a lot of those songs, yeah. but I, they were the songs that I hooked into. And I was into the Everly Brothers, all the usual people that you would get on standard radio and standard television, Elvis Presley, the Beatles, anything that came along, you know, you would inspect it. I think somewhere along the line when I was a senior in high school, especially right in that period, uh, I was really picking up on uh, Dylan and and all the different people that he led to, looking back to Woody Guthrie and other people who sort of surrounded him. And that was a new level of songwriting and what the song might accomplish. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> what about John Prine? Well, as far as I know, I was the first person in Knoxville to buy a John Prine record, or for that matter, a Bruce Springsteen record. I, I searched these guys out. I went to a record store out in West Knoxville and uh, I was looking in the Chris Christopherson bin at his records and um, just because he had a 
couple of records out, and those early records of Christopherson were tremendous songs. I mean, he really changed country music. And even though he had a gruff old voice and all this, and he he sort of talked about how I can't sing or this, that, or the other, and he had to be talked into singing and so forth. I loved it. I loved the songwriters' versions of their songs. And when I looked in this bin, there was a note that the record store had placed there. It said, if you like Christopherson, check out John Prine. So I went over, bought his first record. And at that point, from that point on, I was uh, hooked into him for a long time. I was a John Prine jukebox. Yeah. So it's got to be interesting that he has covered one of your songs and recorded one of your songs. It's great. How did that, how did that come about exactly? I know you, you were on his label, oh boy. But how did it come about where he recorded one of your tunes? Well, I don't know what goes on with John, but he doesn't need anybody else's songs, obviously. Um, he, um, I used to tour with him quite a bit when I was on his label, and occasionally I would show him a song. And uh, after I wasn't even on his label anymore, I was still doing shows with him occasionally, and we were in Wheeling, West Virginia. And there's a theater there. I think it's called the Alabama Theater, of all names for it. It's right where you cross the Monongahela River, and it's uh, old, one of those old theaters. And yeah. I got to play a lot of those thanks to John Prine. Beautiful old theaters, much like we have in Knoxville, Tennessee, and the Bijou. Um, but it was in between my set and when he came on, and I said, uh, John, you got a minute. Let me show you this new song. And uh, Dave Jakes, uh, who as his bass player, was standing there as well, and and I just showed him this uh, song. Uh, that's how every empire falls. He caught a train from Alexandria, just a broken man in flight, running scared with all his.
checked it out, listened to it, and after it was over, he said, man, great song, I really like that song, and uh, after the show that night, I wrote out the words for him and gave it to him, and uh, I remember when we got to Tulsa the next day, um, his uh, guitar player was at the desk of the hotel, just checked in, I was just checking in, he said, R.B., we rode down from Lawrence together, and he says, John played that song for us four times on the stereo on the way down. He's really into it. So that was the best news I'd ever heard. <laughs> so I was, that's, that's the whole story on that. And yeah. eventually he recorded it. He showed me his version of it. And uh, he didn't think he did it so well the first time. He said, I don't think I told the story right. Uh, but he, um, and it didn't end up on his last record, uh, the CD. Uh, which he won a Grammy for, and I really wish it had been on that one. But he's putting it out in the record out in platinum, you know, which he still likes to do. And what and what brought that song out of you, or do you know? Well, I get all caught up in the whole politics of the country, like everybody does, and everybody's got their take on one thing or another. And I just saw how, uh, at, you know, this is back. I think the song was written in 2001 or two or some, 2002 maybe, the spring, and it sort of came out of all these feelings, you know. Even though the song itself only touches on that a little bit, it, right. it, it's got five verses, and each verse is about something else, sort of. To flip the coin, uh, a song like "Old Copper Penny," you know, "Empire" I think is a very serious song, uh, deep song. "Copper Penny" sounds almost like a Tin Pan Alley classic. Like the first time I heard it, I said, oh, I, I bet that's an old classic. And I went to look for it, and oh, it's R.B.'s. Uh, I didn't know you had that in you to do like a, the classic old Tin Pan Alley. How did that one come out? Well, I wrote it uh, driving back from Nashville to Knoxville. Um, I had this old pickup truck that I was always riding in. I actually bought from Scott Miller and ended up... Did he leave the song in there? <laughs> <laughs> there were a few things he left, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, we ended up putting about 300,000 miles on that truck between us. But I didn't have a radio in it. And it was a good place to write because of that. Just, you know, you get into that uh, automatic pilot going down the highway and ideas come to you and there's something about having a little bit of something to do, the driving, to distract you. And you can pursue ideas, you know, more easily, especially if you're alone and no radio. Yeah. And the idea, the first line or so came to me, and I actually said, ah, I can see where that's going, sort of the Tin Pan Alley thing. Yeah. And I said, somebody else can write that one. But before I knew it, it was kind of coming out, you know, and uh, I just sort of finished it up. And I could hear the melody in my head as soon as I could sit down with the guitar. It was kind of there. This is a song uh, that I'll probably get more requests for than any other song I've written. It's called Old Copper Penny. I'm like an old copper penny by the side of the road. Nobody wants me and I have no one to hold. But everyone sees me and they walk on by just like I ain't worth a dime. But I'm heads up and happy. I'm ready to roll. I know I'm not silver. I know I'm not. Whoever holds an old copper penny like me I've seen your big deals I've watched some fall Slid through some cracks and I fell through some holes But count on me to have a good time Just brush off the dust and you'll see me shine Cause I'm heads up Happy, I'm ready to roll. I know I'm not silver, I know I'm not gold. But I'm good luck to whoever holds an old copper penny like me. I 
I'm looking for someone who's looking for me, someone to say. So not having a radio helps music. Yeah, it helps <laughs> songwriting. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> of course, you know, at WOT, you need to keep that on constantly, 24 hours a day. But I've, I've noticed myself if the TV's broken or, you know, th a lot more things get done in general. And, I, and, and like I noticed when I had an office job that uh, when the Internet was down, like people came out and talked to each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all distracted. Yeah. The, as the great distraction is what we're all up against and we all become addictive to it in one way or another. It's whatever can fill our time, busy our hands and fill up our eyes and ears and we get lost in that very easily. I do and I think everybody does and it often takes a situation where you're cut off from it yeah. before you get some kind of clarity or you can focus a little longer on something. Do you have a place that you like to go go right or a hideaway or what kind of cynics do you do before you? Well, I, I don't exactly. I don't have what you would call the uh, studio exactly or anything. I work at uh, home yeah. and do the best work when I'm alone and can be just undistracted and focused. But I do notice that when I'm traveling, and especially on longer trips, um, that ideas come to me more, that I, I'm, I'm cut off from my usual surroundings, I'm left with myself, so to speak, and though it's not always easy to follow up on a lot of ideas, uh, the mind does start to embrace ideas and connect one thing with another and build on it a little bit. Why do you think so many songwriters say they can't write on the road, which to me seems like the perfect place to do it, or the perfect inspiration, but a lot of people say they can't write when they're on the road. You probably get used to where you work, and, and your mind uh, does that because that's where you, s the space you set aside. Uh, and when you're on the road, there are other, uh, there's surprises. It's always a little new, even though you get used to it. You have to deal with uh, this, this, and this. You have to get, to, and so you're caught up in that, and it's hard to uh, bring yourself to it sometimes. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite newer songs you've written is the Amsterdam song. Did you have to go to Amsterdam to write that, or did you, could you, did you write it here? Where did, where did that one come from? It was written in uh, Amsterdam. Um, I was over touring around playing some shows with uh, Hector Kirko and we had a few days off and uh, he, he went up the coast somewhere just to spend some time by himself, do some reading and whatever else. And I thought we were in uh, The Hague, that's where we were staying, in Den Haag. And I thought, I'll go up to Amsterdam, do a little research. So What kind of research? Well, I went to uh, the Van Gogh Museum, which was incredible, unbelievable. Yeah. And it was great just to get lost among crowds and walking by the old canals and stuff like that. And, and um, there was a little neighborhood uh, bar that I came to that had uh, n no tourists or anything. Uh, just people you could tell who were from the neighborhood and who knew each other and they had, they had the guy who was uh, it's afternoon, it was like a restaurant but it was a little bar too and the guy who was behind the bar uh, played the music played a lot of incredible world music just from different places and I was just all alone there trying to write some postcards and stuff, that was very inspiring you know and, and when I left I just had to get back to the train you know Sitting on the train to Dean High and waiting on the whistle to blow. And 
It's the one song I can say I wrote on a train. I've been waiting a long time for that one. <laughs> Since the Knoxville-Birmingham train line closed down a few years yeah. back. <clears throat> trains, uh, trains make great places also with this, for creativity or thinking, writing. Yeah, you don't have to drive or anything. You can just sort of look out the window and take notes. And, and that's what I did. I actually um, sat down in the seat, got on the train, sat down, was all alone, waiting for that whistle to blow so that the train was going to move, and uh, I just started writing it. And it really, it doesn't happen very often, but it kind of came straight out. I still have the journal, which is pretty much almost exactly what the song became, and I finished it as the train was, you know, after we got so far down the way, you know, I finished it by the time the uh, conductor came by asking for your ticket. Because he he said, well, uh, your ticket's uh, not first class. You're sitting in first class car, so you'll have to go back. You know, and I, and I didn't realize it at the time. I said, oh, I'm really sorry. He was very nice. He said, that's okay, but you'll have to go back. So I went back. But the uh, the song was written in first class. <laughs> that's I'll, I'll I'll never hear it the same way again. <laughs> uh, this is Todd Steed. I've been talking with R.B. Morris here on Studio 865, Knoxville singer, songwriter, poet, book writer first class invader.
Thanks for coming in. Hey, it's great to be here. Yeah.